This hearing will uh, resume. Uh, this is our second panel, and our second panel is uh, Mr. David Becker. He's the former general counsel of the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Mr. Becker, welcome. Uh, just to let you know that your written statement will be made a part of the record, and you're recognized for five minutes to summarize your t testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Nugabauer, Ranking Member Capuano, Chairman McHenry. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you, and I thank you for listening to me. I welcome all your questions. I am eager for them because for the past six months, there have been many incomplete, misleading, or just plain false things written about me, and I'm eager to answer any and all questions to put this matter to rest once and for all. At all times during my service at the Securities and Exchange Commission, my abiding goal was to advise the Commission as to the course that provided the greatest benefit to investors and that was consistent with the law. I am confident that any fair review of my actions will demonstrate that this was the only motivating principle behind them. Such a fair review has not yet been forthcoming. In sum, I was informed by the SEC Ethics Office that I had no conflict of interest in the Madoff liquidation and that there was no appearance of such a conflict. I did precisely what I was supposed to do. I identified a matter that required legal advice from the SEC's Ethics Office, as was my usual practice. I almost never started a new matter without getting clearance from the Ethics Office. I sought that advice because I firmly believe that no one should be the sole judge of the ethics of his own actions. I followed the advice of the Ethics Office completely. The Office of Inspector General report contains no findings to the contrary. Indeed, the report confirms that I disclosed the existence of my deceased mother's Madoff account to at least seven people at the SEC, including my boss, Chairman Shapiro. I took no steps to conceal the existence of that inheritance. The apparent recommendation of the Office of Government Ethics that this matter be reviewed to referred to the Department of Justice is, upon review of the Office of Government Ethics, less than it seems. The recommendation stems from the fact that OGE is precluded by law from making any determination that the criminal conflicts of interest laws may or may not have been violated. And here I'm quoting from their letter a sentence that appears in a footnote in the next to last page of a 118-page report. And in fact, the Office of Government Ethics expressed no opinion on that issue. I came back to the SEC because I care deeply about the agency and its people, because my friend Mary Shapiro asked me to, and because I thought it was my duty. I knew the SEC was in crisis and in need of revitalization and reform. I was flattered that Chairman Shapiro thought I could help, and I thought so too. While I had enormous affection for the SEC, my years of SEC service and of representing clients before the agency had given me a clear-eyed view of its shortcomings and of the measures that might be taken to revitalize it. I still care deeply about the SEC, and I have seen firsthand how the process I have been through over the last six months harms the agency and the public interest. This has been a dreadful experience for me in ways that there is no need for me to detail here. I am extremely depressed and very sad that this has been a dreadful experience for my friend Mary Shapiro and the SEC as well. And I fear that this process has been very damaging to the public interest in ways that just cannot be apparent to the subcommittees. And so I thought I would comment a little bit about that. And I'm going to comment about that simply by repeating what I said to Commission members and the staff about this very point when I took my leave of the SEC last February. And I quote from my remarks here. 
From the day I walked in the door two years ago until today, I've been asked how this time around is different than the previous time. The answer is that it's a hell of a lot harder. In some ways, we've made it harder on ourselves. In others, we live with constraints not of our own making. And in other ways, we just live in times that are much meaner than they were 10 years ago. It's riskier to work here than it used to be. As you may know, I'm having some experience with this myself. Unfortunately, too many people have experienced those risks firsthand. This time around, I've had more than a few people in my office weeping with fear about what might happen to them because one person or another was looking into their behavior. I've been shocked by that. That shouldn't be. It is a symptom of the times and a political culture that is, quite frankly, seriously nuts. To some extent, this enrages me, but mostly it makes me very sad. I'm sad for the agency and for my friends, and I feel terrible that I haven't been able to help people more. And it is the biggest source, the source of my biggest worry for the commission as I leave. When I left here in 2002, I worried a bit that the agency might be too complacent. I have the opposite worry today. I worry that all the risk that people run will make the institution gun shy. It's only natural, but I hope I'm wrong. I hope people here have the capacity to listen to the agency's critics, be intensely self-critical, keep an open mind to a better way to do things, and in the end, never ever back off from doing what we believe to be right. No one should take imprudent risks, and we shouldn't sugarcoat what may befall the best intention of us, but in the final analysis, we can't live scared. In the end, what has made this agency great is people who say the hell with it, I'm gonna do what's right, knowing that we are imperfect beings who often can't know what's right, and knowing that the risks are real, that we'll be, we will be called to account for our failures, or for our successes, or just for being here. It is so important that people here bring cases, drop cases, adopt rules, walk away from rules, solely on the basis of what is best for the people we serve. The people in this room believe that, I know. That's why I love you all, and why the privilege of having been with you for a time leaves me deeply in your debt. I spoke from the heart when I said those words. I'll speak from the heart today. I welcome your question. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Uh, you made a couple of points, and I want to go back to that, that, that you came to the, uh, to the SEC for the, the second time at the request uh, of the chairman, <laughs> and uh, you, with good intentions, would, would you say that that was correct? Uh, I, I would say they were good intentions, so, yes. Yeah. And, but I think one of the things we have to differentiate here is good intentions and good judgment don't always coincide. Would you agree with that? Oh, I, it, as a general proposition, sure, I'd agree with that. So I think that the, the point we're, we're this hearing about today is about, you know, people using good judgment because, as you know, and you've been around the SEC for a number of years, you've represented uh, people before that, and you know the very high standard uh, that the SEC, uh, you know, requires of the people that, that they oversee. Is that a fair statement? Yes, it certainly is. Yeah. And so I think that the, the point that uh, a lot of us are concerned about is someone with your intelligence and your background and your reputation uh, coming into the agency at, at a time when they were, you know, obviously under a lot of scrutiny, very high profile case, they had, they missed it, they screwed up. And so you come in, Mary's brought you in, uh, and you uh, uh, obviously have some financial interest uh, uh, or consequence uh, or benefit uh, from the outcome of some of the distributions to the uh, victims of, of this. It, it, because I believe if, if these numbers are correct, I, I believe it's your testimony is, is that your, I guess it's your dad or your mom put about 500,000 in uh, the, the Madoff and, and, and y'all cashed it out at about 2 million is, are those close numbers or am I? Um, those are numbers that I first heard of in um, late February of this year. 
when I arrived at the SEC, uh, all I knew was that in um, some time before my father died, my father died in uh, 2000, that he had opened an account in my mother's name. I didn't learn directly that my father had opened it, but my mother was a social worker and an academic, and she didn't do any uh, investing. I didn't know what he'd put in. But, but I didn't know when he'd put it in. But, but, but the question is, are those, are those, are those uh, fairly accurate numbers? Um, I, no, actually, I don't think so. Um, uh, I, I think Are they more? That, are they less? Or? Well, I'll, I'd be delighted to tell you. It, it, uh, I believe the records show that my, uh, the account was open for um, uh, $500,000 and that when my brother, in acting in a representative capacity for my mother's estate, liquidated it, there were two. There was about two million dollars in the account. The amount that came to me was much, much less than that because um, what I got from my mother's will came after estate taxes were paid. The money went to everybody else designated in the will. So I got my share, and I think I don't remember what the number was. Uh, well, uh, but let it me was just go much, much less than that. Yeah. So, so, so there, you, you, you're familiar with uh, uh, the concept of net equity? Yes, I am. Yeah. And what, what is that? Net, net equity is a, a statutory term in the Securities Investors Protection Act that determines how a customer's claim, that is, how much is paid out to the customer of customers who have open accounts at the bankruptcy, how much they get. And, and so basically, if I understand net equity, basically is uh, you, the, your basis is what you were what you paid in less what you were paid out? Well, I think that was the issue. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, and the SEC before you came uh, had uh, already kind of uh, had an informal agreement with uh, CIPA that uh, that the, the number that they would use uh, the net equity position, um, but shortly after they got there, you were arguing that they should consider the constant dollar approach, and so so my question is is if you use those two methods, and you assume that the trustee uh, is successful in uh, his lawsuit uh, against you and your estate or your how, what, however they're bringing that, would those two methods have a different impact on you? Well, let, let me, there's so much uh, sort of thrown into a basket in your question. Let me, let, let me see if I can take um, uh, some I don't have a lot of time, out. and so you're going to have to be, 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 but I mean, it's either yes or no. Yes, that there would be different calculations. I, 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 I can't give you a yes or no, because there are all sorts of premises in your question about what the SEC agreed to that just aren't factually accurate. Let's, let's don't talk about what's agreed to. Let's just talk about using those two methods. Mm -hmm. would, the diff, would there be a difference in the amount of settlement that, that you would have uh, with uh, the trustee? I had no idea that that was the case. And the principal, no, the, excuse I, me, I, I the principal you, methods well, that we were sir, looking at were me. other methods. I didn't ask you if you had any idea what I'm talking about. Would it have an impact? Um, I have been told that circuitously by the uh, 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 by SIPC. I do not know that to be true. I think it is probably true to a relatively small amount. What is relatively small to you? Uh, I would say um, ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Well, the clawback under the cash net equity would be based on what you just told me a while ago would be about a million and a half dollars so um, no i don't think i told you that i think i told you that that's what the trustee has claimed and i think that the the numbers that the trustee is using are just wrong so but but i i knew none of this at the time yeah should you have known that no i don't think so I, I, and, and I don't know, and I did not even know at the time that this was knowable. And, and so your, your, your defense of all of this is that you went to the ethics officer. He said, I might have a conflict. And uh, 
He said, you're fired. I He's told him everything I knew. Yeah. And I said, tell me what to do. And he said, you should participate in this. So if I'm an entity or a broker or a dealer or something that the SEC is investigating, and I make a trade uh, that you find fault with, but I, my defense is that I asked my supervisor if I could make that trade, and they said it was all right, and so I'm, I'm vindicated? Is I, I, well, in, in most individual cases, I'd say that's right. Certainly when it's advice of counsel, absolutely. I've had many cases like that. It doesn't keep you, it, it, but if I break the, if I've broken the law that, because somebody in my organization thought it was all right, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't change my guilt, does well, it? Well, but the notion of knowledge is, in, this, in the case of this particular law, is included in the law. It is what an employee to knows, does to his knowledge. And it, the employee has to know that there is a direct and predictable financial uh, effect on his financial interests uh, by virtue of the action that he's asked to participate in. And interestingly enough, the words direct and predict uh, predictable, I did not hear at all in the first panel. I think my uh, time has expired more than it expired, Mr. Capiano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Becker, first of all, thank you for being here, though I have to be honest, I'm a little surprised that you would come and testify at an open hearing like this when you have another matter pending, but that's your prerogative. Mr. Becker, I want to be clear. From my perspective, I don't really concern myself too much with your specific details, if you want the truth. My concern here, as I said earlier, is whether the, the overall process within the SEC is working as myself and other members of Congress think it should be working. <clears throat> the outcome of a given case raises questions about whether the process worked. I am not here, as one member, to judge you. I'm not qualified to do it. I don't know enough information to do it. And there are other entities that will do that, and so be it. I will tell you that from the limited review I did read within the IG's report, there was no indication that I read there, no hint, no indication of anything, of any criminal wrongdoing. Uh, so my expectation is that maybe it was kicked up simply to pass the buck along, but we'll see. For me, I would have to tell you that regardless of your specific actions or the actions of the ethics lawyer at the time, knowing what I now know, it strikes me that the process of ethical review within the SEC at the time was the shortcoming. And that's my, been my focus. That's why I asked the first panel, what did you learn? What are you doing about it going forward? Not so much your specific case, but it strikes me that anybody who with an investment in somebody they are investigating no matter how it is, no matter how much it is, somebody should have said, wait a minute, maybe you shouldn't be doing this. I've recused myself. I know you have recused yourself on other matters. I've recused myself on matters in my professional life because there was maybe somebody would see it differently. I would be honest, I wouldn't expect you as an individual to make that judgment. That's what the ethics office is for, and that's why that office should be very clear and very precise about its actions. And that's why, to me, I think some of the process, some of the proposals that have been made by the IG have been pretty good. From that perspective, sitting where you are today, having been through these difficult situations, did you read, I assume, I know you read the IG's report. I've, I've read it the, the proposals that were made relative to fixing the process moving forward, would you agree that they're good proposals or bad? Um, I, I haven't thought hard about them. They look fine. Uh, uh, to me, I would not, if it were my call, I would say um, having ethics report to the chairman uh, is not a good idea. Um, uh, if you are worried about um, uh, uh, the impact of having a superior, someone give advice to a superior, I'd worry more if the superior is the head of the agency than I would if the superior wasn't the head of the agency. I have to say, lawyers, um, you know, the Attorney General gives legal advice to the President of the United States. Every general counsel, just about, of large companies reports to the CEO. Every lawyer in private practice gives legal advice to people who can uh, hire and, and fire and retain them or, or, or not. I don't see this as this big red flag. Well, I, I, I appreciate your opinion, but I would respectfully disagree based on and I, there is no perfect process. 
because there is no way you can have somebody who doesn't answer to somebody somewhere along the line. Uh, the question is, as far as I'm concerned, getting them to uh, answer to as few people as possible. It has nothing to do with you or anybody else. I think the IG should report directly to the head of whatever agency they're in anyway. It has nothing to do with you or the SEC. Uh, and plus, even then, I know it's not a perfect system. We have an ethics system here in Congress that's not perfect. But you do the best you can with what you have. And that's, that's a matter of opinion. But again, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I want to wish you good luck because I know it's a difficult situation. And from what I saw, your record's pretty good. Um, I'm hoping that there were no lines crossed, but that'll be decided by other people. And uh, I want to tell you that I respect you for coming here today and, and talking about what I know is a difficult matter for you. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman and now the uh, Chairman McHenry. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here today. And uh, you've certainly had a distinguished time in government over a period of, of years. And uh, you certainly have, a, have had a long and distinguished career in private practice as well. Uh, today, though, this is, this, is a, this is a subject matter that's very sensitive. And with, with hindsight, I think people are looking at this stuff differently. But back in March, on, in my subcommittee, I asked Chairman, uh, Representative Mack asked Chairman Shapiro, uh, do you believe that Mr. Becker was sufficiently aware of the need to avoid actual or apparent conflicts of interest? Chairman Shapiro responded, do I wish now that he had been more sensitive to the potential of this issue to raise an appearance of conflict? Yes, I wish that had happened, end quote. Do you agree with this judgment? Um, I certainly agree that she wishes it hadn't happened. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I personally found that statement extremely distressing to me. I don't like to think that I let her or the agency down in any way um, um, or that uh, uh, anybody feels that way. Uh, having said that, um, uh, when you go to a doctor, um, you put yourself in the doctor's hand. When you go to, when you seek legal advice, you seek you put yourself in, in this case, the Ethics Council hand. I followed that advice. And if the question is notwithstanding that advice, should I have said, well, it's just too risky for me or uh, for the agency? I will say I didn't predict in any way what happened. I didn't think the trustee was going to sue me. I didn't think the sports section of the Daily News in New York was going to make a big deal out of this. I didn't think, frankly, that this committee would respond uh, in, in the way it did. I didn't anticipate any of that. Would it have been better if I did? You bet. In February of 2009, were you aware that Madoff trustees were considering clawbacks? Um, I don't think so. I think what I was aware of, that there had been clawbacks recently instituted in very large amounts for people whom the trustee alleged had been complicit in the fraud. So you're aware that, okay, so you are not aware of clawbacks of Madoff beneficiaries outside of large beneficiaries. And large beneficiaries who the trustee said had been involved in the fraud. That's correct. Okay. So in that March hearing that I mentioned before, Chairman Shapiro was asked whether she regretted your situation. Her response was, uh, quote, I wish Mr. Becker had recused himself. Absolutely. Do you agree with that judgment? It, it, again, um, um, I take that as a sincere statement of uh, her views. I'm I not asking it, your judgment on her sincerity. Well, Do you agree me, with that judgment that you should have recused yourself? I, 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 forgive me. I, I'm, I, I know I talk in a little bit of a roundabout way, but I'm getting there. Um, uh, I, uh, I think, still think, that I did what I was supposed to do. Um, and it, it, it is, I will just have to live with the fact, unhappily, that uh, Chairman Shapiro has a different view. Is it your view that you should have recused yourself 
at that time, knowing what you know now? I don't know what you mean by knowing what I know now. You mean knowing facts about the trustee has sued me? If I had known the trustee was going to sue me, of course I would have recused. Okay. Now, you said you did not, uh, you did not know that certain items were knowable about your, the inheritance you received, uh, the, the nature of the Madoff account. Yes. Do you know more about the nature of that inheritance today than you did in February of 2009? Sure. Okay. I, I, I didn't know. And with uh, that knowledge, knowing the details of that inheritance and that Madoff account, with that knowledge, would you, with the knowledge that you possess today, just simply about that transaction, would you have recused yourself? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I truly don't. I, I don't know exactly or even close to exactly what the rationale of the ethics office was. And I, I think uh, I, I had the view. I, I did not, for example, see the link. I just didn't see it um, uh, uh, between uh, 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 taking a position on measuring the amounts that folks in the bankruptcy can claim and claw back. Now, I don't know how important that was to the ethics office. I don't know how important the, the sense of imminence of, um, of a lawsuit was. I don't know that merely the facts of the account would have changed my view. Thank you. Thank you. I have the gentleman from uh, Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I must say, first of all, I want to thank you for being here today. Go ahead. Um, and I know that this must be difficult, um, considering the fact that your case has been referred to justice. I must tell you that uh, I kind of agree with Mr. Capuano. Um, this case troubles me from a, a standpoint as a lawyer and one who has given advice many times to many people um, that you went and got the advice of folk and now you find yourself in this difficulty but and that so I want to go to some things that were testified to earlier and I just to clear up some things there was uh, earlier um, Mr. Coates talked about um, subordinates and you had gone to subordinates and one of the things that they have cleared up in the new recommendation, I know you've been concentrating on other things, is to make it, you know, so that I guess you would report directly these kinds of things to the top person. Um, did you in any way feel when you were being interviewed or talked, and you talked to these seven other people that cleared you, said you were okay to, to do this, that they were under any pressure whatsoever? No, and, and, and in fairness to them, um, I, I think the point of my uh, talking to those seven other people is that I, I didn't make any effort to conceal this. I, I, those, in fairness to them, those weren't, not all of them were people who would have had any responsibility uh, uh, to clear me uh, or not. And, and I, I did think it was inappropriate uh, of Mr. Cox to say in his report he saw seven people, and none of them said anything about this. This had nothing to do with most of their responsibilities. All right. Well, well, let me get through these questions because I want to make sure we're clear. Yes, sir. Uh, you got people probably going to look at this film 50 million times. Um, I, I may reconsider them. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Becker, um, who exactly had a, a, a duty to identify that there w was a potential conflict of interest and disclose that information appropriately, appropriately throughout the commission to commissioners and the relevant staff? Who would have that duty? Can you answer me very briefly? Yes. I, I don't think anybody has a duty to report things that aren't conflicts of interest. I, the, you either have a conflict of interest or you don't. And you didn't believe that you had a conflict? That's correct. Um, as the IG found in his report, you seem to not believe that there was a strong possibility that the Madoff trustee would bring a clawback action against you, specifically, as you explained in a May 2009 email to the SEC Ethics Council, Mr. Lennox, quote, uh, your instinct is that any claim you would, uh, would, be, would be much too small and of dubious merit to bring in any event. 
could the fact that you viewed the possibility of a clawback suit be to be remote have led you to misjudge whether or not you had a conflict of interest? Well, I, I, I was very careful not to make that judgment. That judgment was made by uh, the ethics office. I just told them what I knew. And uh, a little earlier, there was a question by Mr. Issa, and he asked a question about if, if and I guess he would be referring to you, if you presented bad information to the people that you talked to, um, he talked about what the result would be. In your mind, did you present any misleading information or something that was not true? No. Um, and could the fact that others also viewed the possibility of a clawback suit to be remote have led them to misjudge whether or not you had a conflict of interest? I, I just can't say what was in there. And if you had, if you thought that you would be subject to a clawback lawsuit, what would you have done differently, if anything? Hard to say, but I probably would not have, have participated in the matter. And um, if others at the SEC had thought you would be subject to a clawback lawsuit, do you believe they would have done things differently? I, I guess you mean the ethics office. I think they probably would have, yes. And why did you come here today to testify? I mean, I, mean, I know you, you, we asked you to come, but, I mean, what, what is your objective? My objective is to get the truth out. It's as simple as that. I got nothing to hide. And you, and you believe that uh, you did nothing wrong. Is that right? That's correct. And um, you inform William Lennox, head of the SEC's ethics office, um, that your mother's um, Madoff account shortly before or after I arrived at the SEC, this is your quote, never, and, 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 and I never asked Chairman Shapiro or Mr. Lennox not to share the information about my mother's account. Um, what was that all about? Um, I, I didn't treat this as some deep, dark secret. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I went to the ethics office for advice. I didn't say don't tell anybody. Um, I didn't tell lots of people just because I, I, I frankly didn't think about it, but I didn't take any steps to uh, protect this information or conceal it or anything like that. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has run out. I thank the gentleman. Um, Mr. Becker, in a letter you wrote me and my colleagues, you stated that you recognized that it was conceivable that this issue could affect your financial interest because the issue could affect the trustee's decision to bring clawback actions against persons like you. Correct. Now, Mr. Becker, you can see that it, it might affect your financial interest. Isn't that if you if you had that, uh, if you recognized that, wouldn't that of trigger that maybe this this, this will have an a, appearance of a conflict of interest? I mean, uh, let's just get past the, the legal part, sure. but I mean, uh, it, it goes back to what I was saying a while ago. Sometimes good intentions and good judgment don't always, and is, is a, 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 a lawyer that's, you know, been practicing for, for a number of years, and particularly in, in an agency like the SEC, where you're very sensitive to, to either actual conflicts of interest or appearance of conflict of interest, that, that just didn't, didn't that didn't resonate with you. Well, appearance is um, is is used in two senses. There is a rule that talks about appearance, and I I don't think it's a close question that I was well within the four corners of of, of the rule. There is appearance in in the sense we've heard this talked about earlier today is the Washington Post test, the New York Times test. That's very subjective. You, you can't even get people to agree what newspaper um, is, is the relevant one. Um, and sure, I, I uh, thought of that, but in all candor, I did not anticipate um, uh, either that the trustee was going to sue me or that it, um, uh, the reaction would be what it has been. But, but you said, but if I misunderstood your letter, you did anticipate that that was a possibility, did you not? I Conceivable, I think was the word yes. I used, which yeah. means there are a whole bunch of things that are conceivable, but, and, but it, when, and when the level of probability is what governs. Okay. But, but when you conceive of it, you're thinking about it, right? And so you're aware of it. You, 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 in other words, you, you had knowledge that you potentially uh, could be subject to a, a clawback lawsuit uh, uh, in, the Becker, I mean, in this matter. Yes, conceivably, possibly, maybe, yeah. but I did not think that was going to happen. And so I want to go back to 
there was uh, someone asked Congress asked you to come and testify. You all had a little team meeting, and it was decided that you would have to disclose uh, these interests uh, in in uh, the Madoff in, uh, issue, uh, and uh, it was determined that uh, you should not testify. Is that correct? Um, no, not quite. That's not quite how it worked. What happened was I was going to testify. I came to the head of the Office of Legislative Affairs, just like I went to ethics, and said, listen, this is a political calculus. This is not the world I know. I want to know what you think about it. He first says, oh, I think it's fine. Later in the day, he calls me up and says, well, I'm a little worried that it's going to be a distraction. And I said, well, if it's going to be a distraction, I mean, you can be sure. What's going to be a distraction? The, uh, the fact that my mother had an account. And I said, look. So you disclosed to, to those, the ledge folks oh, that. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I also told them that uh, I would mention it up front to take any question that I wasn't disclosing it off the table. And I said, you guys make the political judgment. And later in the day, he calls me and says, well, I don't think it's such a good idea. Let me check with the chairman. He checks with the chairman and that evening says to me, well, I spoke to her and I, I, I think we'd be better off with somebody else. I saw her the next morning and she confirmed that. That's in, basically in, all that happened. In fact, you all had a conversation and there was some, some kind of laughing and joking that, oh, you'll get another opportunity. Yes, I don't think this is what she had in mind, but yes. Yeah. Well, here, here's, here's the other question then. Then if you felt like uh, it, was it was appropriate to disclose to the ledge fairs people before you went to Congress, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to reconcile why you didn't think when you're making a, a very important uh, presentation to the commission between encouraging them to use constant dollar that, that you didn't think it was appropriate to say to those folks, and by the way, you know, I, I, this could impact me. I mean, if I was a commissioner, or if you were a commissioner, uh, w wouldn't you, wouldn't you, because subsequently to this, all of those the commission members were not happy that you did not disclose that. Well, um, I don't know the questions that were asked in them. Uh, the uh, quotation from Commissioner Aguilar said he was upset that this conflict wasn't um, disclosed to him. I didn't think I had a conflict. I was told I didn't have a conflict. And you don't generally make a habit of going to people and say, you know, I don't have a conflict, but I think you ought to know about it. You say that to them, they say, well, what message is he trying to send me? When it came to uh, Congress, which um, uh, is not the world that I am uh, uh, familiar with, I needed to take someone's advice. But you are familiar with the world at the SEC. I am indeed. Yeah, and so and go back to the high standards uh, of ethical behavior that you hold, you know, the, the people that, that SEC regulates. Uh, I, I just, I, I st in, in the fact that you stated in that letter that you, it was conceivable that you had a, an issue there uh, and that you had felt later on to, to disclose that, why, why along the process, I, I agree with my, my good friend, Mr. Capiano, it's a process here, but there is some personal responsibility that goes with in these positions, and that uh, that that how that you didn't think that there was some potential conflict there. I'm, I'm, st I'm still having a hard time reconciling that. Well, um, I take complete responsibility for my actions here, and frankly, it's easy for me because um, I think I behaved appropriately. Um, it is passing strange, I think, to say to people, uh, I've got something to tell you that I've been told doesn't affect my judgment, that I don't believe affects my judgment. It doesn't color the advice that I've uh, given them. Um, uh, I don't think it would have been inappropriate to tell them. It's not a bad thing to tell them. But I didn't think of it, and I think the reason I didn't think of it is it really was not germane to what they were doing. I see my time is up. Uh, now the uh, gentleman from New York. Gary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Becker, count me among those who are surprised that you're here today um, and also impressed with the fact that you're here today. Um, you have been very forthful, I think, with, with us. Uh, you were very 
forthright with me when I spoke to you when the story first broke in the, uh, in the New York Daily News, despite the fact that it was your scheduled last day to be on the job, uh, and I appreciated, appreciated that. Glad to do it. Um, am I correct in, in restating that it was your father that opened the account for your mother? I, I believe so. I, I don't know who else it could have been. Um, I'm quite certain that it wouldn't have been my mother. So it had to be somebody other than your mother, and that yes. logically would have been your father? Yes, it would have. Nobody else was going to give her half a million dollars in an account? Um, well, my father traveled from time to time, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing that I knew about. Um, he, he also op opened accounts for charities that he gave I, money to? I don't know whether he opened accounts for charities. I know he gave money to charities. He had a particularly favorite charity uh, in Westchester, a, a Jewish seminary, a rabbinical um, school? Outside of, of uh, Philadelphia. I I'm sorry, outside yes, of Philadelphia, there, was there's it? There's a, a rabbinical school to which I believe that he, he gave found a great deal of money, yes. He gave a great deal of money to them. Yes. Do you know if he, if he they, they did have a Madoff account that they sold the year after he died, I understand. Um, I, I, as I mentioned to you on the telephone in February, I, it's the first I had heard of it. Um, it may be that um, uh, someone that he knew there was uh, recommended. But he endowed, he endowed that seminary. Um, no, um, he contributed money to them. They were endowed from many sources. Did your father know Madoff? No. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I would be amazed if he did. I mean, I, I, I see you, you, you do not know how, how he or your mother wound up with a Madoff account? I, well, the I Madoff don't know game for was sure. he played hard to get. You had to know somebody to know somebody to. Well, um, I don't know. When you're 85 years old and you've got a lot of money to invest, uh, 500000 I suspect, it was much easier than it appeared. Would you have thought your father had a reason to know that it was a Ponzi scheme? My father? No. My father is the most ethical man I've ever met, and I'm 64 years old, so there still may be others, but no. Your not mother would, would not have suspected that she had an investment in a Ponzi scheme? No. When did, when did you suspect that Madoff was a Ponzi scheme? Um, I never suspected until I read it in the newspaper or... However, when it broke, but you knew who Madoff was, and I, I, I had heard the name when when I was at the SEC the first time that he was in. Uh, there were there were indeed reports to the SEC that it was a Ponzi scheme by Mr. Markopoulos and others. Not not that I saw, not that I heard of, not that anyone. I mean, w we now know there were, but I had no idea of that. So you had no way of knowing, or should have known, that it was a Ponzi scheme. I, that's correct. Can anybody have known that it was a Ponzi scheme? Could anybody have known? I think once the thought enters your mind that it is a Ponzi scheme, it's not that e hard to figure out. When it was brought to your attention by Annette Nazareth that there was an alternative view to last statement, well, she brought it. She brought the case to your attention. Is that not accurate? Uh, I, I I don't want to insult Ms. Naz Nazareth, and she may be sorry to hear this. I don't remember that she brought anything to my attention on this. I remember other lawyers who were involved. I think the report had stated that she wrote a letter on behalf of her clients. Well, that's interesting. That That is, I have to say, a characteristic of this report. She was one of, I don't know, 10, 12 signatories to that letter. She didn't write the letter. But there were others who had that view. Yes. Indeed, there is a subcommittee chairman of our committee who has a bill that says that we should be using that methodology. Yes. Aware of that. 
if if you had gone along with that suggestion which is a bill before this congress uh, and proposed by people and written to the commission among others if if you had adopted that view you would have been a greater beneficiary that's what i've been told i guess that's correct but i frankly the thought never crossed my mind why did you decide that the view should be the cost of money um, we struggled for that literally for months. We were very worried uh, about the impact of this. On you knew at that time that you were the beneficiary of an account? I knew I was a beneficiary. Well, I knew that my, I got money from my mother's estate. I didn't get an account. I knew. Your brother, your brother handled it from what you yes. said, and your yes. brother never said there was a $2 million account that he was I, I learned. I learned that in February of 2009. Uh, the same I, time you came back to the SEC, same uh, month. Yeah, just a, slightly before, yep. I'd already agreed to come to the SEC. But you, your brother liquidated a $2 million asset within an account to which you were a beneficiary without you knowing that there was even that account? Is that what you're telling us? Th yeah, that is exactly what I'm telling you. There was a lot more money in that account? That $2 million was not a significant thing to tell you? Uh, I don't know why my brother didn't tell me. I, th I think the money, uh, when he did tell me about it, was basically he called me up and said, isn't this interesting, in effect? Uh, this guy made off. We sold, we sold out of his account to pay estate taxes a few years ago. That's all he told me, and that's when he told me. And at that point, you felt no compunction to reveal that again to the is that when you revealed it to the ethics I, uh, people? Yes, pretty much. I mean, yes, when, when I arrived at the SEC, I, I reviewed, I sat down with them for, I don't know, an hour, two hours, reviewed anything and everything. And you knew what clawback was at that time? I'm not sure. Yes, I knew what it was, yes. Do you think that the people in the ethics business knew what clawback was at that time? I don't know the answer to that. They're not necessarily the sophisticated person in finance, as, as are you, though. Um, I, I, I really don't know what they knew. But you, even, even though there was only a slight possibility of you being subject to clawback, you did not think that it was appropriate to suggest to them that you might have that problem? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that when it became relevant to anything that I was doing, that I did mention that to them. You went back to them and told them that you might be subject to Absolutely. clawback? Absolutely. And they did not suggest at that time a different answer than they gave you the first time? Um, because if there was clawback, you would be subjected to a legal action? Um, no, no, they didn't. Um, and um, I mean, the short answer is no, they didn't. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Now, Mr. McHenry. Uh, thank you. Um, the commissioners all told the Inspector General, it's in his report, that by November 9, 2009, when you recommended the constant dollar approach um, to them, that they understood that this choice would affect the amount that the trustees could seek in, in clawbacks. Uh, did you? Um, no, I didn't. Uh, I read the Inspector General's report and referenced all sorts of things, conversations that apparently took place before I got to the SEC, and no, I did not know that. You did not know that the rule that the commissioners testified knew what effect the amount the trustees could seek in a clawback. You didn't know this? Uh, that, is, that is correct, and I have to say... I wasn't saying, like, your account. I'm just saying, generally speaking, that this constant dollar approach would affect the value of what they could seek in clawbacks. Well, the, the, the only area that we, we as an office and I as a human um, thought about that was clawing back monies that had been paid by SIPC. Um, I'm, I'm not sure at all yeah. um, uh, that, in fact, the definition of net equity will control 
uh, uh, what you can get in clawback uh, uh, cases. I know very well that if I were representing a trustee, there are a lot of arguments I could yeah. come up with that it wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, and that is being argued right now. Yeah. In court. Okay. Now, in terms of, uh, you said that the possibility of craw uh, a clawback for, for the account you're an heir to, mm -hmm. just to be clear, you're an heir to, was remote, right? So that I thought of it as remote. Yep. Right. In February of '09, just, just for context. Okay. So this is what I'm trying to understand. Sure. There are SEC commissioners that within the within the IG's report say that they're angry that you didn't disclose this to them. They were your client, in essence. I mean, your general counsel. But. But you disclosed this as a matter of optics, is really the discussion, you know, and, and matter of the appearance to the Legislative Affairs Office, right? You mentioned it to the chairman at the very beginning. You went to the Ethics Office, said it was fine. But then you bring it up later to the Legislative Affairs Office. Why not just tell, why not just tell the, the SEC commissioners? Well, um... I don't remember considering telling this to the SEC commissioners. I, I, I will say that this is a different arena uh, requiring different judgments. Uh, frankly, when you're testifying in front of Congress, politicians have been known to be uh, political. And, <laughs> and, and um, uh, you think about things differently than when you think about simply what do I need to tell my clients. And I just, I, I was out of my depth when it came to political judgment. Interesting. So I, I just got to ask you this. Sure. With the mess that you're coming back to the SEC to help clean up, which was the ramifications of this missing Madoff, right? Why not, why not just recuse yourself? Why not just say, look, I know ethics says I'm fine. I've disclosed this to the chair chairman but you know what it's such a hot button issue and this is the sec we want to have, be above reproach i'm just going to recuse myself well why uh, wouldn't you do that well um i think that's a great question and and uh, i'm glad well you thank you i thought so too well excellent so I we hope you'll give a that. great answer um there's two sides of this if 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 i'm looking um I'm trying to think of a delicate way to put this. I worry sometimes that people spend too much time worrying about covering their rear ends than doing the right thing. I had a job, and I wanted to do my job. And sure, if my principal was concerned, concern was um, um, I want to take no risk that I'm going to be criticized and that the agency is going to be criticized. Um, that's what I would have done. But I, the risk that what would happen happened, that uh, uh, this would get all this press, that David Cotts would write a dreadful report, um, and that we'd have two hearings on the same subject did not occur to me. So you just didn't consider recusing yourself? Oh, I considered it. I, that's why I saw gui sought guidance from ethics. I was told that, in effect, there was no need for me to consider myself. Have you recused, recused yourself myself. previously? I'd say when I was at the SEC, I've recused myself 50, 100 times from things. Right. And, and was it because ethics counsel said you must every time? Uh, I'd never say every to any question, but um, I'd say certainly the vast majority of the time. Were there some where you just said, you know, I, just out of appearance sake, I, I should. Um, I, so I should recuse myself, I should say. I, I can't remember a time when I didn't follow the advice of ethics. Um, and frankly, uh, Inspector General Kotz's uh, mentioned that the, um, I got treated differently from other people, and and I, it 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 he he 
couldn't be more wrong. Um, but I, yes, I always followed ethics advice. I guess as a lawyer, um, I'm, I expect my clients to follow my advice, and, and as a non-hypocrite, I behave the same way. And because you're a member of the bar, you should have a higher ethical standard as well. I will match my ethical standard against anybody in this room in a heartbeat. Do you see how people have a problem with the appearance that you're an heir to a Madoff account, that a decision that you recommended to the SEC, a governmental regulator, then affected your financial well-being, even if it's small? Do you think that's a problem? I, you know, I, the problem with this is the standard that you're using as a sort of appearance standard is it's almost like a perpetual motion machine. You say, you know, I think it's a problem, so it must not look good. And, and in truth, um, over my career, I'm pretty careful about ethical matters. And I do see what has happened. Uh, I'm not pleased about what has happened. And I think that there's a whole range of reactions ranging from absolutely sincere to a... Uh, uh, lack of understanding as to the facts, lack of understanding as to the legal standards, and some people whose motives, I must say, I don't trust entirely. And, and finally, I, uh, thanks for the uh, chair's indulgence. Knowing that you were subject to a clawback, okay, knowing that, if you knew just that fact, would you have recused yourself? If, if you mean subject to a clawback that I was, that someone was going to institute an action against me, I do believe I would have recused myself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And now the gentleman from New York, Mr. Ackerman. You, you were in the agency previously. Yes. You left. Yes. You went into the private sector. Yes. You were earning a lot of money. Why would you come back? Oh, it's sort of hard to answer that in a, a non-self serving way. Uh, I came back because Mary Shapiro asked me to, um, because I care a lot about what the agency does, because I saw Madoff. Madoff was a kick in the gut to the agency. Um, I've represented clients before the agency for a long time, and I thought the agency needed to look at things differently and do things differently. And I thought it was my duty to do it. And Mary called me up and her words were, David, your country needs you. How do you refuse that? You came back because it was a challenge. Well, that too. You came back because your talents were needed. Um, I, well, yeah, I was flattered into believing that, yes. If you would have recused yourself, you would have taken yourself out of the action and your ability to help which is the reason you came back, evidently. Uh, I, I think that is correct, yes. In your exuberance to do that, do you think that colored your view as to whether or not you should have recused yourself? Well, it's why I didn't rely on my view. It's why I basically had someone else make the decision, because I truly believe that when it comes to one's own conduct, no one is a very good judge. The fact that you stood to gain even what to you might be a small amount, didn't color your view to make that decision to go with constant dollars or the cost of money or however you want to phrase it? I can honestly say I did not give that an instant's thought. Why did you decide that constant dollars was the best of the various proposals? Well, choose. The you supported that. You wrote, you wrote a, an amicus, submitted it to the court, supporting that position. Why did, why did you think that was the best way to go? Well, um, our attitude, uh, frankly, was to find theories that would enable us to get as much money as possible within the law to victims. Um, and uh, we sort of bumped around in, in, into other things, uh, among other things, and we came up with something, we came up with constant dollars, and the more I thought about it, 
the more I became convinced that were I a judge, I would say that's the right interpretation of the law. So I said, let's go with it. I will reveal to you that I am among a group of people and the main sponsor of legislation because I came to the same conclusion you did and thought that would help the greatest number of people who were made off victims and have introduced legislation to use constant dollars. So I've now laid that on the table and revealed it. If I now said to you that I've now discovered that I have a Madoff account, what do you think I should do? I just made that up, by the way. I, yeah, I think it's time to sell. It, um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, the, I made the is, second part up. Right. The first part is true. Right. Um, uh, look, is, my the, question is, is it easier to see it on me than it is on yourself? Well, I, th I think that's a, um, a, a fair question. And um, this is a part of the country in which one's motives are constantly questioned. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, I did not see this coming. Um, and if I had, it might well have affected my judgment. Well, nobody asked me, but I'll tell you what I think. I think you got blindsided slightly while trying to do the right thing and are paying a personal price to it. And that, that's politics, and it happens here very often. Uh, but if I'm any judge, and I'm not, uh, and I hope you don't have to have a real one give you a determination, but it seems to me that, that you acted on the best of instincts and exercise some judgment that some people may want to question for political reasons and for judgmental reasons and appropriate reasons as well. Uh, but if it means anything, uh, and it certainly doesn't in a court of law, but I think your dad would be proud of you. Thank you very much. That's a very kind thing to say. I thank the gentleman and uh, now the Chairman McHenry. Thank you. And I just have a, a few questions. Uh, uh, Commissioner Nazareth was mentioned earlier in this testimony, um, in, uh, early in questioning, and I just wanted to ask you about this because um, former SEC Commissioner Annette Nazareth told the Inspector General that she knew that you had received proceeds of your late mother's Madoff account. I is that true? Uh, if she says it, it must be true. Um, I have no recollection of that, but she is a completely honest woman. Did, did you discuss your, Madoff's, uh, your mother's Madoff account with Commissioner Nazareth? As I say, she, uh, if she says so, it must be true. I don't have any recollection of it. Okay, okay. And, and so, by her own omission, she, you know, according to the, SEC, uh, the SEC's Inspector General report, that's what she said. So, uh, when she is a, an attorney and these other lawyers wrote you in May of 2009, um, looking through the, the typical correspondence with SEC, it was a little odd that it was directed to you as the general counsel rather than the chairman or the, the board, but... No, not at all. I'm, uh, it's asking for the SEC to take a certain position in court, and so I would be the one who got that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, then, then, I'm, then I'll uh, accept what you're saying. But they, they asked for particular intervention on the Madoff's trustee's choice of an account valuation, the last account statement method, didn't she? If you recall, there's... I, I believe, yes. Okay. Um, so isn't... Did, did you consider your... Uh, the account you're an heir to in, in light of this? Did, did this enter into your thought process? Well... When you're um, considering this? First of all, I wasn't the heir to an account. I was, I got a check. I got a check that included the You're the heir to the proceeds of the account. I'm, oh, I'm sorry well, to be but imprecise. it's a big difference. And um, uh, I got a check and, this, and the proceeds of that, and that check included 
money that apparently came from an account that I didn't know anything about. Uh, this, that letter was what led me to consult with the ethics office. So yes, I did consider that. Uh, okay, so, in, it, so you consulted in May of 2009 with the ethics office. I consulted twice. I consulted at or about the time I came and on this particular matter in May. Okay, and, and they cleared you again? Yes. Okay. Um, so did you consider, so obviously, so you consider that, that this could have an effect on you at that point or potentially? I considered, as my email says, that it was conceivable that it could have an effect. Okay, so why didn't you recuse yourself at that point? Because there are all sorts of things that are conceivable, and it's all about probability. And um, based, I, I did not know facts. I mean, I basically put all the facts in front of the ethics office, said, here's what I know. Advise me as to whether this falls within this relevant statutes and rules. And I was told, no, it doesn't. Okay. And you said that you that certain uh, items about um, this this um, the the proceeds of this account, which you were the heir of, just to say it correctly, that you didn't know it was knowable to have this information about the account. Correct. It, why not in May when this came up, when you went back to the ethics office, that you? You ask further questions of, of your brother as execu uh, executor of, of the estate. Well, I, I don't remember what I asked of my brother, of, of, and whether I did or I didn't. I now know for certain that he did not know. He simply did not have the information as uh, when the account was opened and, and how much was put into the account. Um, so I, um, that information just wasn't available. In terms of estate tax, that wasn't uh, important information? No, estate tax isn't based on uh, the gain during the lifetime of the decedent. It values the assets as of the time of death. So it was not relevant at all. Okay, okay. So uh, do you think it was troubling, though, that Commissioner Nazareth, n knowing that you had received these proceeds, uh, of a Madoff account, um, that you could be subject to this clawback. It would, do, you, do you think that was, uh, in, in asking you to take an official action, do you think that's questionable? I think you're attributing a lot of na uh, knowledge to me and a lot of, and all knowledge that I had to Commissioner Nazareth, and I doubt that that was the case. Um, uh, I'm a professional. Commissioner Nazareth is a professional. We represent clients, and we um, uh, uh, advocate the views of uh, clients. And, I'm, and had she thought about it, I'm sure she would have thought that recusal or not was between me and the ethics office. Okay. I don't know that she thought about it. Okay. Professionals make mistakes. Yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank God for that, or I wouldn't have a living. <laughs> That's correct. But... Knowing what you know now, you would have recused yourself, wouldn't you? No. Well, when you say you're knowing what I know now, Congress. if I knew that I was going to be sued, sure. You're testifying before Congress because of this appearance uh, of, of impropriety. You're testi you, you have an Inspector General's report that's been referred to the Justice Department because of this. You, you've been sued. I mean... Uh, you would recuse yourself. If you, you were able to rewind the tape, would you have recused yourself? I would have recused myself if I knew I was going to be sued for legal reasons. The fact that uh, Inspector General Kotz is making a big fuss uh, about uh, having sent something to the Justice Department doesn't move the needle as far as I'm concerned. I have seen uh, Inspector General Kotz do this before make a big fuss, lots of publicity about um, sending uh, reports to the Justice Department. Nothing has happened with any of them, and some of them that I recall from my time at the SEC were laughable. Is this laughable? Uh, you know, they, they say um, 
a, a, a comedy is what happens to someone else and tragedy is what happens to you. So this is a tragedy. Should I view it as a comedy? Uh, I think you should uh, 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 view this as, as someone who shoots straight, um, uh, did what he was supposed to do, and is not deserving of uh, uh, the type of uh, public criticism um, uh, that he's gotten. That's how I think you ought to look at this. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I also want to thank the gentleman for uh, having a joint hearing with us. I think it's been a very good day. We've uh, had a lot of good uh, testimony. Uh, Mr. Becker, we appreciate you coming and uh, My pleasure. Uh, giving us your time. I want to remind uh, uh, all members that uh, they have, a, uh, if they may have additional questions for this panel, which uh, they may wish to submit in writing without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 30 days to members to submit written questions to these witnesses and to place their responses uh, in the record. And uh, Mr. Capiano, thank you. Thank you. This hearing is closed.